So if we can bring our first panel up, uh, did Hollywood really go to war, myth and meaning in World War II films? And uh, we'll get this uh, program rocking along here. Uh, and uh, I'll introduce our speakers, but uh, I know this is gonna be an exciting session to kick things off uh, for us all, because we're specifically going to be looking at the impact that film and media have had uh, in shaping the public memory of World War II for better or worse. Uh, so uh, uh, we're going to get into that in just a moment. We also know that there are many critics all the time, uh, as our uh, panelists will, uh, will uh, attest to. There are many critics of major Hollywood films that accuse them of being overly sentimental, romanticizing the war, uh, fictionalizing uh, major battles and personalities, but uh, they're not trying to do nonfiction work except it's in the form of documentaries. But whatever you believe in that regard, there's no question that these films do, uh, uh, sh sh not just the films coming from Hollywood, but from all over the world, play a very important role in shaping our public uh, memory of the war. And many of the best, I would say, uh, attempt to be uh, authentic from their own uh, perspectives uh, and uh, or realistic within a two hour or an hour and a half or a series. So other films that present a more cynical perhaps or depressing view of the violence uh, that uh, was done to societies and individuals. And then of course there are satiric and comedic uh, films such as Catch-22. Uh, but the U.S. government uh, began shaping the memory of World War II, uh, even during the course of the war. And those of you who keep up with the evolution of the Hollywood and the portrayal of World War II know that uh, they, the, the films have run the gamut since 45, but uh, one of the notable film directors, George Stevens, was a, a, a famous film director before uh, the war and even more famous uh, perhaps afterwards. But he was with the U.S. Signal Corps uh, and went in on D-Day and, uh, and took both a color film and black and white film. The black and white was the official film for the Signal Corps. And, and he influenced uh, uh, much of what we know because he began taking the raw footage of that uh, uh, the, of Normandy and, and all the way into, into Berlin and was very uh, uh, impressed uh, emotionally and intellectually by the magnitude of the epic war that was unfolding before his very eyes. He looked at this as the most climactic and signif most significant event in world history, and he wanted to record something of significance to match the unfolding disaster of the war. Uh, and uh, so from the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, we have one of the early resources of raw documentary footage and film and from the many renowned photographers as well that recorded everything uh, that they witnessed. And Hollywood took it from there uh, and, uh, and influenced much of our collective memories. And we'll talk later, perhaps, in the roundtable about, for example, the, the great differences between two great films, one in the early 60s, The Longest Day, uh, and then later on in the late 90s, uh, Saving Private Ryan, and how that uh, affects uh, uh, our society and, and, uh, and viewers. So there's no question about the impact. Uh, and there's no question that we as historians uh, have to recognize and acknowledge the impact and understand the impact of the film and also of, of veterans. Like it or not, in our society, the, our country uh, supports a more positive view of America's war aims and, uh, and outcomes uh, of the war that might be found in other nations. Uh, but in whatever the, the, the national origin, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the stories and the memories uh, are very sharply uh, drawn, uh, and especially uh, by uh, filmmakers. Our discussion today, we have a most distinguished panel of historians and producers who are experts on, on the subject, and I'm going to introduce them now. You have bio information online, so I'm not going to go into any lengthy introductions, but suffice it to say that Dr. Nick Cull, professor of history at U University of Southern California and past president 
of the International Associated for, Association for Media and History uh, is an association that gathers experts who just study just media and images and film and shaping memory. And we have also Kirk Sadowski, uh, executive at Plato, uh, and a longtime friend and member of the museum's presidential counselors, uh, here at an advisory board uh, that consists of distinguished historians, uh, um, museum leaders, journalists, and uh, filmmakers. Uh, Kirk uh, falls into that latter category and uh, a filmmaker and has been executive producer for the HBO Band of Brothers, uh, The Pacific, uh, which I'm sure many of our audience are familiar with, currently finishing the, the new uh, blockbuster 10-part series on Don Miller's Masters of the Year, the Mighty 8th Air Force bombing campaign over Germany and the occupied territory. And maybe he's going to tell us during the session when it's going to come out. Kirk. So, uh, uh, in any event, he has also been involved with the uh, production of some of the most uh, famous uh, documentaries. And then Robert Chester, professor of history, University of Maryland, recently gave a wonderful presentation at our International World War II conference, which we were able to host uh, on site. He is a, a thoroughly versed in the history of film, of, of World War II, during the war, after the war, and uh, all the way to the present day, and I think you'll found, find him a uh, fountainhead of knowledge. Now, each of our uh, panelists will, I uh, want to turn it over to them, they're going to talk for about uh, 12 to 15 minutes, and I'm then going to moderate a, a, a panel for about uh, 30 minutes after that and start them off with a question. And so that'll just be a, a general discussion among, among the experts. I might pay, pose a question from time to time, uh, but in the last 20, 30 minutes, uh, we're gonna open it to the audience who can submit their questions, and I think they know that already online, uh, and they will be curated and brought uh, to my attention or to the panel's attention in the Q&A part. And, uh, I've already told the panelists this, but uh, if, if people go on too long, I'm going to use the airborne cricket, and uh, and that will be a signal that uh, that they've gone on too long, and uh, and somebody else on the panel has got their hand up, or else uh, there's another person from the audience later on who has a question, and we need to get the question in, in front of our table. So. Uh, uh, I think we're going to work in a, in a chronological fashion, uh, beginning uh, with the evolution of films from starting with the war. And I think, uh, uh, Robert, uh, I think you were going to start us off? Yep. Yep. Oh, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very uh, much. Pleasure to uh, be pleasure here. To be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about memory, remembering in two different senses. Um, the first being how we reconstruct a usable past, how we give meaning to the past. And the second, as in the opposite of dismembering, a kind of putting back together, remembering. Um, and what I want to talk about particularly today is early post-war films and how they dealt with the dilemma of race in American culture. How these early post-war films sought to give meaning to the war in terms of the directions America was going to take post-war, having just, of course, fought against avowedly racist foes, uh, what direction was the post-war nation going to take? We talk about World War II as a time of unity, but we also have to understand that the country was, was riven with racial strife before, during, and after the conflict. So uh, a lot of these films I'm going to talk about, it's worth noting, were made with some form of cooperation from the state, whether it's the Office of War Information, the War Department, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, which was briefly and gloriously called the National Military Establishment. So they have an involvement, they cooperate or they dissent on scripts and, and, and they choose to help or otherwise with filmmakers, depending on what the film is saying. What I wanna outline very basically is a shift which takes place from wartime and the early post-war years into uh, the years of the Cold War. And I'm gonna go from basically 45 to about 55 um, briefly, and you'll forgive me if there are omissions in this, and indeed there will be. So there's a shift. During the war, after the war, there are these uh, predominantly liberal calls for the war to be remembered as an anti-racist enterprise, which should propel the United States into a more democratic and egalitarian future. As the Cold War takes hold and more contemporary concerns about the nation's image 
um, as a society with racial problems and that at the same time, you know, the leader of the free world, um, there is an erasure of race and discussions of democratization that takes place in World War II films. I've got some uh, PowerPoint slides, um, and if I could have the first one, uh, that would be great. Um, is that going to happen? Yeah, wonderful. So the, uh, the second slide then. Uh, this is the iconic, as I say here, articulation of the multi-ethnic platoon. This is MGM's Bataan in 1943. And as you can see here, uh, pictured among the American troops defending uh, the Philippines are an Asian character, a black character, Desi Arnaz as a Latino from L.A. There's a Jewish character, a uh, Pennsylvania Pole, an Iowa farm boy, et cetera, et cetera. In these wartime films, this is really the first time that the nation's military has been imagined as a seamless and united multicultural, multiracial entity. Um, obviously, with Nazism as the foe, it made sense uh, in terms of propaganda purposes for the nation as a whole, and in terms of the war aims to show the nation as united despite its diversity. And Bataan is the um, quintessential articulation of the post-war, of, of the early war, of the wartime, excuse me, multiracial platoon. This gets more complicated post-war. Um, I'm talking about film today, but the next slide or two are going to talk about uh, or reference two novels. At the end of the war, there was great concern, particularly among American liberals, that uh, the veterans coming back, the white veterans, might not have swallowed whole these ideas of democracy and of racial tolerance that the nation had ostensibly at least supported uh, as it fought Nazism. Uh, the first uh, novel uh, on the next slide is Niven Bush's They Dream of Home. And this features five Marines readjusting to post-war life. It's actually a wartime novel. Uh, and within these five Marine veterans, there is a triple amputee black combat veteran who is also an advocate for labor rights and civil rights. And he's very sympathetically treated as is a Native American character in the novel. In the next slide, um, which is the cover of Richard Brooks, the former Marines novel, The Brick Foxhole, this novel characterizes the US military as um, a haven of fascism, even, of racists and bigots. Um, and it expresses a concern that the war aims were, were going to be forgotten by such men. And I'm quoting here, Brooks writes, many of the men who had fought on Eniwetok and Kwajalein and Guadalcanal had peculiar ideas about liberty and freedom, which sounded like white supremacy and Protestant justice. So the early battle is over what direction will we take memory of the war? Filmmakers and Hollywood was replete with liberal voices at this time before the sort of Cold War purge. Um, filmmakers tried to do this without addressing the most thorny issue, which was the future of white and black race relations. So other non-white groups became surrogates for the need for an anti-racist memory of the war. The next slide shows uh, a promotional poster for Paramount's A Medal for Benny, a B picture from 45, uh, which is about the heroism of a Latino GI who's died in the Philippines and he's gonna receive a Medal of Honor. But the white elites of the California town in A Medal for Benny seek to co-opt the memory of that medal uh, into publicity, uh, selling real estate, propaganda for the town, whilst forgetting the sacrifice of the Latino and his community, which is poor and excluded. Ultimately, at the end of the film, as the next slide shows, uh, the medal is presented by the military to Benny's humble Chicano father, who gives a speech talking about how the strength of the United States lies in its diversity and our need to mark that as a legacy of World War II. This was a film that was made with approval of the Office of War Information, the um, wartime propaganda agency, and of the War Department. They offered their help and support. They lent soldiers and equipment, showing their countenancing of this particular democratic articulation of World War II memory. As I say, though, they avoided talking about black Americans. And in the next slide, um, you'll see a shot from They Dream of Home, which was the film adaptation of the Niven Bush novel. Excuse me, the film is called Till the End of Time. It's, a, it's an adaptation of They Dream of Home. And the black triple amputee and civil rights hero is turned into this white gentleman that you can see here. 
The film does have an anti-racist message right at the very end, but it doesn't give us non-white veterans and it doesn't give us a sense of the struggles that they may have encountered. They whitewash in some ways the novel's content. And this is because they were concerned with upsetting uh, conservative forces in the United States that did not wish to see sharp and swift democratic reform on the back of black service. So a white character replaces a black one. In the next slide, you'll see a promotional poster for perhaps the most stringent and overt articulation of the war's need to be remembered as a moment of integration. Home of the Brave came out in 1949. It was produced by the Signal Corps veteran Stanley Kramer, directed by another veteran, Mark Robson. And it tells the story of a black surveyor played by James Edwards, who's thrown in on a Pacific mission with a group of whites. He's the only person available. He is not greeted by all of them particularly positively, as, as, as you might imagine. And the film suggests that racism and prejudice inhibited the war effort. And as you can see from this poster, uh, there's no room for prejudice, no place for prejudice, it says, in the home of the brave. Racism here is articulated as un-American. Um, the film concludes with the black GI befriending a white GI and heading off into the future. The next slide, as you'll see, um, shows one of the white GIs, called character called TJ, uh, refusing Private Moss's handshake. One of the things that's happening by 49 is that the liberal impulse is being diluted by Cold War concerns. Images of American racism were damaging to the Cold War nation's reputation overseas. And conservative forces, such as the FBI, which was monitoring Hollywood quite vigorously by this time, there's a lengthy file on Home of the Brave, you can read it at the Library of Congress. Um, Anti-racism in the FBI's eyes became associated with communism. And they had their own sort of... Uh, ...was a communist film, and Home of the Brave was accused of being such because it included racist whites, and particularly because the racist white in this instance was a successful and wealthy businessman. So Home of the Brave attracted a lot of negative attention um, from the FBI because it was dealing with the war and the memory of war as necessarily, in its view, an anti-racist enterprise. When you go to the next slide here, we've got an image uh, advertising the 1949 film The Red Menace. And this was one of many films expressing this shift in terms of how the war was to be remembered. In The Red Menace, people who are championing civil rights in America are targeted or accused of being somehow associated with communism and with what used to be called racial agitation. Many of the filmmakers who were targeted by the House Un-American Activities Committee had made anti-racist films about World War II. Irving Pitchell, who directed A Medal for Benny, was one of the original 17 summoned by Huwak to answer for his supposedly communistic filmic content. In The Red Menace, it's un-American to talk about inequality. It's communistic even, and the communists of the film are shown as ensnaring veterans um, with promises of a better future, only to try to suck them in to the communist web of deceit. In the next slide, you'll see a still from Samuel Fuller's film, The Steel Helmet, which came out in 51. On the left, as I look at least, um, a Japanese-American World War II veteran. On the right, James Edwards again, playing an African... Uh, an African-American World War II veteran. So we've got a Japanese-American and an African-American. In this film, uh, a North Korean major is captured. It's a Korean War film. And he tries to use the prejudices of the nation in World War II to turn these two soldiers of colour against the nation. Both of them dismiss this communist as a propagandist and claim that their allegiances are American first. Uh, the James Edwards character says, right, yeah, I can't sit at the front of the bus, but maybe in 50 years I will be able to. Despite this clear refutation of communist critique, Fuller was still summoned to the DOD where he was accused of being somehow traitorous for even bringing these subjects up. So the address of World War II and the memory of World War II that the liberals had tried to put forward. We need to remember the war as a democratizing moment. This slipped away into an erasure 
uh, but was part of the Cold War because the Soviet Union made absolute hay with images of American racism. That was one of their chief weapons against the United States in the propaganda war. And so anti-racism became suspect in the eyes of many. And we're talking here about the FBI in particular and the House Committee for the Investigation of Un-American Activities. Uh, the last film I want to discuss in any detail, and I, I'm going to do so briefly uh, because the, as the demands of time, is Red Ball Express. This was a film, uh, as you'll see from the poster on the next slide, which dealt with truckers supporting Patton in post-war Europe. When they first made the film, now some of these truckers in reality had been African-American. When the film was first touted as being a, a project for Universal, they were going to use Italian Americans and the black press heard about this, made a huge fuss. And so some black characters were introduced. It's cut off slightly but you can see Sidney Poitier's name, bottom middle. What happens in Red Ball Express, however, is that while Sidney Poitier feels that he's the victim of racial prejudice, and in the next slide you can see a still from the film where Poitier has spoken um, in a way that one white soldier objects to, to two white uh, red, red Cross women handing out coffee and donuts. But the racism is only of the one white individual. Poitiers is imagining prejudice where it doesn't really exist. The DOD was invited to help make this film and they resisted the racial angle at every turn. We feel the wound is closed, the Department of Transport uh, consultant with the film said. Why are we talking about race and World War II? We need to forget this and move on. So the film dismisses Poitiers' fears of racism as paranoia. The soldiers cooperate, they support Patton, and they defeat uh, or help to defeat Nazism. Ironically enough, uh, the DOD, which didn't like the racial angle but supported the film anyway, allowed them to film at Fort Eustis, Virginia, which was still a segregated facility. So even as the film denies the existence of racism, the black actors were forced to occupy separate living facilities on the base, because the base was still segregated. The armed forces, of course, integrated officially in 48, but that didn't happen until some years later, and it happened slowly like all forms of integration did. So, Cold War pressures told on this memory of the war as something that ought to propel the nation's democratic inclinations forward. By the mid-1950s, with a few exceptions, and I've generalized a little today, race, had disappeared. Race as a problem had disappeared from World War II cinema. It became a non-issue, and where multiculturalism was evoked, it was evoked in this seamless and unified manner, just as it had been in films like The Tan back in the war. My last slide is um, Audie Murphy, who is, to my knowledge, one of only two people to have played himself in the story of his life, the other one being Jackie Robinson. Um, the DOD loved to Helen back. There's no racial tension. There are simply heroic soldiers cooperating with one another. There are no black soldiers at all. And the film, like so many Cold War films of the 50s, is instead a call to preparedness in case we have to go again, right, in another great war, this time against the Soviet Union. So that's the early trajectory of, of, of memory wars, if you will, over how to remember the war in post-war cinema. Uh, and the racial critique doesn't really sit, resurface again till the mid to late 60s, the Vietnam era, which changes World War II remembrance in profound and significant ways once again. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and I look forward to, uh, to addressing any questions you might have later on. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. That was quite quite uh, interesting and revealing, and I'm sure we'll have a lot to say about it when we get back into the roundtable. So I guess uh, uh, Nick, the other Nick, uh, will take over at this point. Is that right? We're going Nick next. Yep, I'm ready to go. Go ahead. So, so I'm a historian who mixes the study of communication and culture with the study of government and foreign policy. And uh, as you're already thinking, Yep, that means I'm thinking about propaganda a lot of the time. Um, my chief sense of World War II, as we now remember it, is that we're not in the midst of a single deliberately constructed media propaganda memory. Rather, we're at the intersection 
of many stories told for many reasons, and even the unintended consequences of stories that were told or left untold in the past. Now, as Robert has already explained, some of these stories were originally created by the government, shaped by the government, uh, but I would say that all of the stories have their own momentum and are sustained in the first instance by people's preference. Because we have to remember that in the US, um, the, we have free media and um, the uh, audience taste is the bottom line. Now, some of the cases that will be discussed at this conference are uh, very different. For example, I'm looking forward to what Rana Mitter will have to say about uh, how World War II is remembered in China. There, uh, the memory of World War II is absolutely um, regulated and driven by a government, uh, a government agenda. I'll talk about three phases of uh, war movies. I'll revisit the wartime, I'll talk about the later Cold War and something about the Vietnam period. Uh, the story of the uh, movies that were um, uh, created during the war uh, still inform our memory, the, the way we think about the war. I think particularly of the role of Casablanca as kind of a defining collective memory of the war. Uh, the origin of these wartime films, as, as Robert uh, pointed out, was dominated by the Office of War Information, which had a Bureau of Motion Pictures located right in Hollywood. They didn't tell Hollywood uh, what they had to say. They didn't uh, uh, censor Hollywood films. Rather, they asked every producer to think, will this picture help to win the war? So that, that pressure thematically uh, changed the way the war that was, was represented and set up uh, a number of themes that come down to us uh, today. And I agree with Robert that the, the multicultural um, image of uh, the US platoon is, is a, a really important uh, part of this. Um, but I'm also interested in the way in which um, the uh, enemies were uh, represented, with the Japanese uh, being represented as a, a, a racialized uh, enemy against whom there could be uh, no compromise, the Germans uh, being uh, represented somehow as uh, badly led, uh, led by uh, Nazis or converted into political fanatics. Um, but th there's a kind of a break on the representation of, of, of Germans uh, that um, uh, isn't applied to representing of the of Japanese. And I think wartime representations of Germans are restrained by the memory of the wholesale demonization of Germans during World War I. And you have to remember a lot of Germans, a lot of German Americans are uh, very important in, in the war effort, German, uh, American citizens, and uh, are on the lookout for things going too far. But maybe more problematic from the point of view of the post-war is the way in which allies are represented. And Hollywood uh, indulges in massive over-promising in its representation of allies, particularly uh, Russia and China, uh, overstating the extent to which these states were converging with the United States in terms of their politics. And when uh, the post-war behavior of Russia and post-war uh, development of Chinese politics diverged from what had been promised during the war, um, Americans were very disorientated, and this is part of the, the public opinion uh, foundation for uh, the Cold War and the uncertainty uh, over what had happened, who had betrayed um, uh, American interests. Was it spies? Was it uh, some enemy within? Um, uh, so the, the, the overpromising of Hollywood, I, I think, was a um, uh, was a, a, a problem here. I would also say that Hollywood was rather coy in discussing the Holocaust. I think that was simply uh, too shocking, and uh, addressing the issue of anti-Semitism head on uh, was uh, difficult. Uh, some of the studio bosses were worried, as a people of Jewish origin themselves, that they would be accused of special pleading. And um, you, you have this strange uh, uh, embarrassment around actually naming the particular race singled out 
by uh, the Nazis. Uh, there are many of the, um, uh, both in Hollywood treatments and in uh, documentary films uh, made by the War Department, they will just say these people were enemies of, or the, the state said these people were enemies. Uh, they were Germans, they were Poles. It, it, it won't identify which ethnic group they uh, belong to. And I, I think this caused the problem for later memory because it placed a, a, a greater burden on later filmmakers. Um, who had to, um, I, th I think, carry more of a burden of representing uh, the Holocaust in, in, in later films. When it comes to the Cold War, I'm really interested in the way in which people who'd seen the war, uh, Sam Fuller, George Stevens have already been mentioned, uh, how their filmmaking changed because of what they'd seen. Um, in the case of Fuller, you can see more realism in his crime films. George Stevens uh, puts realistic deaths into Westerns, specifically because he'd seen the concentration camps. But this is the influence on other genres. It isn't explicitly representing World War II. So when I look at the representation of World War II, I'm struck, uh, said by many of the same things that Robert said, the way in which the Department of Defense remains active reviewing scripts in return for allowing access to military uh, weapons. But the bottom line for Hollywood is that movies are a business. The government, or sorry, um, the government is an ally for Hollywood because it can help with exports, because it can help with um, materials and extras and uh, things like that. Um, but uh, bottom line is uh, business. We can see that memories of war, movies about the war, are influenced by business, particularly by the, the wish to maximize the international market. Sometimes this was to do with uh, a studio's need to unlock currency that had been earned in a foreign market. So uh, dollars, uh, uh, or sorry, local currency would have been paid to view a movie, uh, but that currency couldn't be converted. And so Hollywood studios need to think of a good reason to make a movie in, say, Greece or uh, Sri Lanka uh, that could unlock uh, that uh, money And the war was an obvious theme for uh, something that Americans were interested in, that the world was interested in, that had taken place overseas. And so to get money out of uh, Sri Lanka, they decide they'll make Bridge on the River Kwai. To get money out of Greece, let's make Guns of Navarone and, uh, and, and, and so forth around uh, the world. Um, there's also a, de uh, a desire to export films. So war films with war themes are pleasing to uh, the UK and France, especially if allies are uh, well represented and sympathetically represented. Uh, they're also, um, uh, <laughs> also able to sell films to West Germany and Italy, uh, which means uh, being careful how enemies are represented. However, there's no market in the East Bloc, and so uh, I, I think that it's no surprise, uh, even with um, Cold War feeling, uh, that uh, the East Bloc kind of drops, uh, sorry, the East Front kind of drops off Hollywood's uh, agenda. We have a run of movies depicting good Germans, uh, emphasizing this point that the Germans were badly led, but not themselves inherently bad. Uh, the first of these is probably Desert Fox from 1951 about Rommel. Um, I'm very fond of The Enemy Below, uh, the submarine movie with uh, Kurt Jurgens and Robert Mitchum. The end of that movie, the um, German U-boat captain and the American destroyer captain reconcile. They share a cigarette together and talk about the need to cooperate in peace. That's from 1957. So it's already depicting, making visible on the screen a, a revision of World War II that plays into a, a Cold War collaboration. Uh, big co-productions uh, in the 1960s uh, are looking for success in multiple markets. And so this is part of uh, the story of The Longest Day in 1962, uh, which has its own uh, sympathetic uh, or, or realistically represented, somewhat sympathetic uh, German uh, story, or at least the Germans are played by Germans and get to speak German. Tora, Tora, Tora in 1970 uh, is a, uh, a real effort to tell the, the war from both the American and Japanese sides simultaneously. Um, 
I'm fascinated by Hell in the Pacific in 1968. Even though it's a World War II setting, I think it's clear that that film is dealing with Cold War concerns. Uh, Lee Marvin, Toshiro Mifuni is uh, two... Um, uh, sailor, two uh, airmen crashed on the same island, uh, forced to cooperate in order to survive. The film uh, kind of makes visible uh, the theory of mutually assured destruction in the nuclear age. As the war recedes, as it becomes distant from the actual event, it becomes easier to talk about its negative side. Uh, and one of the first to emerge in uh, movies is reflection around militarism, tension between individuals who want freedom, who are reluctant to be in the war, and characters who are, in the title of one film, the war lover. Uh, often these have literary sources rather than being based on any historical character or memory. And I guess Bridge on the River Kwai uh, is an obvious uh, example of this. Sometimes the war lovers are of one nationality and the people who are reluctant to be there are of another. And this is a sort of a divide in The Great Escape, where uh, Steve McQueen, the American characters, uh, are, are sort of, I think sometimes they're trying to escape from the British and their view of the war as much as they are from the Germans. Um, Wars, the war becomes an adventure setting, a place where exciting things can happen on the screen, and uh, the war elements can lend a clear moral drama. Nazis are so obviously evil that they can stand in for all evil in world history. You have a movie like Guns of Navarone, where a special forces team have to wear Nazi uniform at one part in the, in, in the film and attempted to be ruthless. Uh, there's a line of dialogue about winning the war by being as um, ruthless as your enemy. Only problem is if suddenly you have to be even nastier than they are. And in Where Eagles Dare, uh, they, they, there's even a moment where you think that the hero might actually really be a Nazi, not just be wearing Nazi clothes, but actually be a Nazi. So this is um, not really about World War II. It's sort of using World War II as a, as a stage to play out moral uh, dramas. In the post-Vietnam period, everything uh, changes. Representing World War II becomes quite difficult, uh, really because of a, a changing or a controversy publicly around uh, the military. And this is clearly seen in the movie Patton from 1970. It's hard to use World War II as a clear moral case. Uh, it's also difficult to tell stories about the American West. And so both the Western and the World War II movie go some place where nobody can complain and you can get all the fun with none of the moral difficulty, that is outer space. Star Wars in 1977 has multiple elements lifted from World War II, imperial uniforms, elements of aerial combat, entire sequence from the British movie Dam Busters is recycled in uh, the attack on the Death Star. Uh, Hell in the Pacific gets remade as a science fiction film, Enemy Mine in 1985. Um, to round things off, I, I think that when we're looking back on war on film, we're not necessarily remembering World War II. Sometimes we're remembering, remembering World War II. So we're, we're doubly insulated and separated from the war. We're enjoying, uh, or audiences enjoy comfortable narratives of moral certainty where nation states get to be good and others get to be evil with no uh, problematic gray areas. Um, and these films just happen to relate to real events, real time and real place. In these circumstances, the voices of the actual participants in war, their experiences, and the voices of historians can be an unwelcome uh, reality check, but I think it's into this um, into this sort of onto this controversial stage that um, uh, producers like Kirk have 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 come and have uh, done some really interesting and important things. Well, thank you, well, thank Nick. You. I think uh, between uh, Robert and, and Professor Cole, we have uh, swept through uh, most of the 20th century. So uh, it brings us right up to uh, Kirk Sadowski. Uh, Kirk, you're on. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Rob and Nick. Let me just briefly 
amplify on something Nick was just saying about filmmakers who were um, influenced by their wartime experience. One of the films, um, one of America's favorite films of all time falls into that category. And of course, it's A Wonderful Life. Jimmy Stewart, Frank Capra uh, filmed much of the war, was part of the Signal Corps. In fact, I think he was the commander of all of them. Uh, all of the filmmakers went over there. And of course, Jimmy Stewart was a, a veteran of the 8th Air Force and flew numerous missions and actually became a squadron commander. And after the war, they both had asked themselves separately, am I, what, do, what am I going to do with, for, what am I going to do from here? How do I go back to, you know, telling stories and the fantasy of Hollywood after I've experienced what I've experienced in Europe. And apparently Jimmy Stewart was thinking of retiring, not acting anymore. And Capra came to him with the story of It's a Wonderful Life. And he get, laid out the plot, which intrigued Stewart. Because if, again, if you think of that movie, how dark it really is. We know the, the uh, you know, an angel, an angel eventually earns its wings, and, and it's one of the great moments in, in movie, American movie history. But it's actually, for about three quarters of that film, it's pretty dark. And in fact, apparently Capra told Stewart that his character um, was going to att attempt suicide. And apparently Stewart said, I'm in. Um, so all the thank you for uh, Nick for saying you know uh, maybe things have changed a little bit. Let, let's talk about why World War II. You know why uh, Rob and, and Nick have just told us, and of course they've just scratched the surface of all of the many dozens and dozens, hundreds probably um, movies made about World War II. Certainly hundreds if you uh, count internationally. But why World War II? And I'll, I'll suggest a few reasons. One. Um, why, why, why World War II uh, attracts dramatists and filmmakers and writers and actors and directors. And I would suggest it's probably the biggest event in world history. I mean, if you think of the number of people involved in the, in the, in the span of the globe, it might be. I, I think it is, and I'm, I'll, I'm, not, I'm not sure anyone has disabused me of this idea, that it's the biggest event in world history. So all automatically, uh, dramatists and filmmakers, uh, creative artists, art would be interested in that. When you think about the number of, um, I used to teach a class at UCLA, and I used to, when we would talk about World War II films, I would introduce it by saying, imagine you woke up tomorrow and the headline was, um, 25,000 people were killed due to this one thing. And then you woke up the following day, 25,000 people have been killed because of this thing and the following day, and the next day, and the next day, for six years, month, week after week, month after month, year after year. Well, that's, that's World War II, that it, when you take, I think, I think the latest figure for, for war, direct war-related um, casualties is something like 55 million people. And over six years, that's 25,000 people a day for one cause. Now, obviously, there's many theaters of war, many many causes, but for one event to cause that. Um, and so one of the things when you do, so you have something of that enormity, that's your subject. When you're, when you're trying to make a film or, you're, um, or a television series, as in our case, um, you're really always looking to place your characters um, under pressure so that they are, that you learn something about them. And placing characters in the crucible of combat is about, that's about as much pressure as you can put a character under. And so that how he or she responds to that pressure reveals who they are for good or ill. And the relationships are, um, the relationships that are, are, um, are formed in, you know, under, again, under that kind of pressure, combat is the greatest crucible you can put your characters under. So obviously, again, it's not just World War II. Any war film that you see, Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the, the Trojan War, whatever it could be, that is a primary reason, other than just the action part of it, which is really separate, um, is what it, what, what it allows you, how it allows you to explore your characters, what you, what you, can, what you can throw at them and how they, how they eventually respond. Um, I remember a few years ago, we were, Playtone was, uh, thinking of doing another, uh, one of our military series. And I was having, I was talking to a, a fairly prominent actor who's pretty, um, 
who's associated with World War II. And we said, you know, why do we keep doing, why, why do we keep coming back to this subject? However we, whether it's the Marines or, or you know, the 101st Airborne, uh, in, the, in our latest case, the 8th Air Force. And we kind of uh, c- concluded two main things. One, what was it really like? What could that have been like? That, that most artificial, if I can use that word, that most artificial of worlds combat. And what was what was it like for those people, both at both the soldiers, sailors, airmen, doctors, uh, nurses, and and civilians? What was it like? And and again, at any at any um, in any war, but particularly World War II for a lot of reasons. But also, and probably most importantly, and this is you can't help but ask yourself, what would I have done? And in some ways, that's the perennial question that you that you want the audience to ask about any any movie that you make. That you place yourself in the position subconsciously. You play as an audience. You place yourself in the position of the lead character. What would I have done? What would I have done? And not just war movies. I mean, if it's a love story and and one of the characters' heart is broken, what how would I have responded if my heart was broken? Or even just what was it like to be in love and how would I respond in that situation? But again, in war, you can't help but wonder, would I have gotten out of the Higgins boat? Would I have stormed Normandy Beach? Would I have gone, would I have, uh, would I have made it onto the beaches of Iwo Jima? You know, what would I have done up in one of those B-17s? So I think, again, war really gives us that opportunity to put the characters in that position in the most basic way you possibly can. One of the things that, um, you know, both both Rob and, and, and Nick kind of alluded to, and it's a, it's an ongoing question: is the sort is the is the subject of accuracy, and how dedicated is any Hollywood film or Hollywood in general? If you can, it's kind of an unamorphous term, but how accurate do we strive to be? I, I cannot speak for any other. Um, any other production, any any other producers, but I know that everything I've been involved with with with, with, with Tom Hanks and Gary Getzman um, at Playtone is that that's the that is the that's the first commandment is as be as accurate as you possibly can. Historical truth is absolutely essential. We strive for it. I promise you. I'll, I'm, I want to give you a couple of anecdotes to 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 demonstrate that. Um, when we uh, when we made Band of Brothers, and this is actually referring to uh, uh, Saving Private Ryan, I think, uh, and again, this is something I used to talk to my class at UCLA about. I think our culture changed when um, on, when the, those famous first um, twenty minutes, twenty or so minutes of Saving Private Ryan. I think our culture changed when the ramps went down on the Higgins boats. And all of a sudden, through through sound design and through the, the editing and through um, the cinematography, we we heard these bullets whiz whiz whiz, and immediately, I believe, three men were just immediately killed. And that no one no one had seen a World War no one had seen World War II combat quite like that portrayed quite like that. It could be instantaneous. You, you're getting ready. We were as an audience. We were getting ready to. Okay, we're going to storm the beach, and there's going to be battles and all kinds of stuff. The ramp goes down, and three men are dead. And I think that, and I remember not only was it a very popular film and all of that, but it there were so many stories about World War II veterans who were fine who who went to what went to see that movie would refuse, and I I've known some would refuse to see world any kind of depiction of. World War II. I know um, Dr. Eugene Sledge, who I'm sure a lot of you um, know, and we, we portrayed in the Pacific and wrote, um, I think, the greatest war memoir of, World War, of any war um, with the old breed. Uh, Dr. Sledge, I never got to meet him. He died before we got involved, but I got to know his family very well. And, and his family told me that he never in his entire life would, would could watch a war film, ever. Um, I think one of his sons told me that they were watching Patton in the living room, and he um, he left the room. And he, he just wouldn't be there, but Saving Private Ryan changed that for a lot of uh, a lot of men. And I got to know that personally when we were doing Band of Brothers. I got to know um, quite a m- number of the men from Easy Company, 
And it was it became a cliche that they didn't talk about it. They just wouldn't talk about their experience. They would talk amongst themselves, and, but they really didn't tell their families, and they didn't tell their you know non-veteran friends. And, um, and there's many reasons for that that I won't that they told me, and I won't get into. But then they did, and they talked to us. I mean, you know, Nick, you were um, mentioning, you know, the, the voices of of of, the, of veterans weren't hadn't been welcomed in um, in, in the in the depictions of war uh, prior. But in Bander Brothers, we opened every episode with um, real interviews that we had done uh, with the real men of Easy Company, and I, you know. To, to this day, many people say that's the best part of the show. I mean, it was a key to, I think, part of the success of Band of Brothers was there. It lent an authenticity um, to the to to the series. Um, but anyway, going back to Private Ryan, when I asked the guys when I first started to meet them and we were conducting those interviews and we were doing research with our writers to 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 write the scripts. And I asked a number of them, why? Why now? Why have you decided to um, to open up and talk about it to any some to any to people other than those of your comrades who were there, and many of them pointed to Saving Private Ryan in the way that finally, the, the America and the world, their children, their grandchildren, their wives, their best friends, um, could understand in some way because the the filmmaking was so seemed to be so honest, so candid, so horrific that. They started to feel comfortable talking about it. Um, when we made the Pacific, uh, another um, in terms of accuracy and what we strive to do, I, we get a lot of, of course, we get a lot of feedback in mail when we do these shows. And I got a letter. Oh, I actually went to Tom, but I got to he gave it to me, um, extolling the show. I mean, it, it was a long letter from a, 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 a Guadalcanal veteran, and he it, he. Had, it, it was really an elaborate letter, and it, and it was really touching. So I decided I was going to call him. And I called him one Sunday morning, and he I was calling him from California. He was in New Jersey. And, of course, at first he was a little surprised that I was calling him. And we started talking. And, again, in the letter, he was very complimentary of the series of the show. And, again, he was a former – he had served on Guadalcanal. And – but eventually, he started giving me a hard time about the language, how the language, the language that we used in the series. That we we had the Marines cursing too much, and and he I, he really spent a lot of time on it. And he was giving. I mean, he he still will say, "Well, that's a great series." But I want to tell you, we didn't talk like that, right? And I realized pretty quickly what he was really saying. He he wasn't really complaining about the way the language that we used. What he was really was saying was, I was there. I was there. I know. This is something you can't know. So however much you try to, to, you know, however accurate the uniforms are, however great the special, the visual effects are, all of that, you can never get it. Because I was there. Uh, and it was very, it was very revealing. Okay, um, Kurt. We got it. Cut, Kurt. We got. We yes. got to break and get to some discussions with the roundtable. Is that okay? We, as we're running a little bit over time now, we've been uh, sure. We, 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 while we get into the discussion, and I'll ask a question and for everybody, and then because we still got the audience, uh, I'm sure that they're uh, setting questions in there. We're already a little bit over, uh, but uh, pardon me for interrupting. But uh, let me just ask a general question, and then we'll go back to whatever y'all want to talk about. But uh, uh, let me just ask you, I think everybody can, can address this in a way. Um, do you think, uh, see these movies on World War II having been produced uh, uh, to appeal to the values and the beliefs about World War II that are held by the audiences? Or do you see the films and the directors de deliberately trying to uh, influence attitudes and memories of the war uh, not, not generally held? Uh, or to ascribe perhaps a deeper meaning uh, about the consequences or the ideals. I mean, Schindler's List comes to mind, for example. I mean, uh, so the, so wh wh where do you see uh, the, the directors o over time? I mean, uh, uh, go, and all of you can probably uh, say something about that. And, uh, and then uh, and, uh, Mike or, or Jeremy can tell me when we have to move on to the Q&A from the audiences. <laughs> 
Well, I think you have, um, to jump in on this, I think you see both. Uh, but I'm particularly struck by the way in which uh, the same filmmakers may be negative in their representation of World War II um, when they're uh, young men rebelling against their fathers. But what, by the time we get through to the 1990s and that generation is dying off, you have a, a conscious desire to honor the, the generation that is is disappearing. And we have, you know, the cinema, explicit cinema and uh, television of, of the greatest generation. Um, so I, 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 I think it works, um, it works both ways. And even the same filmmaker may, may tell the story from two different, uh, with two different emphases. Okay, uh, Rob or Kirk? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I'd have to agree. Uh, you, you see more blatantly sort of commercial enterprises that are seeking to tap into some sensibility that they believe is shared in the culture, but you also get filmmakers who are um, more directly trying to espouse some kind of ideology. If you take a film like Carl Foreman's uh, The Victors from 1963, which he described as being, quote, unquote, dedicated to the proposition that we lost the war, that film is, is self-consciously upturning every pre-existing myth of World War II, you know, they find a puppy in the European theatre and use it for target practice. You know, this is a film where, where, which Foreman wanted very explicitly to, to use to attack World War II mythologies, and I don't think he was overly concerned necessarily um, with it commercially, although, of course, as Nick said earlier, they're all commercial enterprises to some extent. But, yeah, you get both. You get both things happening. Uh, Kirk? Uh, what is yeah. I, listen, the motivations of any given filmmaker is, I think, as Rob was just saying, it, it, it varies in, to individual. I, I don't think, though, that in terms of trying to either demythologize, to, to either uh, um, further the mythology of World War II or to, or to debunk it, I, don't, I rarely would I think that that is an overall intent of any filmmaker. He or she would have certain, as I said before— War is your is the the crucible that you're using, but most filmmakers are basically interested in the characters and the story, and not the over not trying to either further or to debunk a particular view of World War II. And so you don't feel like uh, the uh, uh, film industry overall of the last uh, 60, 70 years has contributed to the what some authors on this conference uh, would call uh, the myth of the good war uh, and the sentimentalization of, of the war and uh, the greatest generation uh, ideas. And they say that the film industry is uh, largely culpable, even though you've done many on the negative and darker side uh, from Hollywood. So how would you, how would you deal with that? Well, I, I think that there's, I mean, I think there's truth, some truth to it, but it's, I don't think that it was, I think it's much more complex than that. I think the idea, I mean, every society that's ever lived I, that I know of has had, goes to war at some point. And I think the idea that, that even the, the very nature of war, we mythologize everything. We mythologize baseball. We mythologize motherhood. We mythologize everything. The idea that we wouldn't mythologize and tell stories that, that further that about the, 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 the most difficult thing that human beings engage in, I think is maybe naive. But um, but yes, and of course the uh, movies have have contributed to that, of course. But I think not not consciously. And again, I know I think that's a little controversial. I have if we have time, I'll tell you if I can when I wrap up. I have a story to that point. If we have time. All right, Rob. What do you think? I think that you know whether or not these things are done deliberately self-consciously, you know, every film is in some way creating an ideology. It's propounding a certain view of a certain event. Now, it may be, you know, and it probably very much is that certain filmmakers are simply making a film, you know, Red Ball Express, which I mentioned earlier, Bud Bottisher directed it, didn't really have much interest in it, didn't really care what it said or didn't say. Um, but going back to Foreman's film, 63, The Victors, it just was very, overt attempt to be ideological. So I think that, you know, and, and regardless of the, of, the, of the authorial or directorial intent, there are lots of other forces that, it, that, that affect a film. You know, you've got the production code, you've got the need for help from the DOD, which is tremendously cost-saving, things like that, compromises are made. So it all comes out of a, a big mess 
of collaboration and, and point and counterpoint. But they're all doing some kind of ideological work, whether they mean to or not. All right. Uh, uh, Kirk, are you, you, before we open it up, or any of you have a, another question that you, or a point that you want to make before we, we do that or ask well, each other? I just wanted to uh, say to uh, Kirk that my, my grandfather, who was a veteran of the British campaign in Italy, uh, would always say to me, oh, we didn't talk that way. Uh, he thought it was very, or his circle as enlisted men thought it was important not to swear all the time because that was the way that regular soldiers behaved. And they were, they were only in the army, he was only in the army because he was drafted. And uh, it, the language was a way of um, maintaining your humanity and civility. That he was a civilian in uniform, not uh, a professional soldier uh, whose language was a badge of um, of, of uh, just how they were operating in the world. So I'm not, I wasn't. I'm not surprised at all that the Guadalcanal veteran would uh, would would say that. Yeah. And yes. And, and I, I'm sorry, Nick. I was going to ask how how, uh, how in terms of characterizations, uh, whether it's language or otherwise, uh, of the. Uh, you could, because you're talking about character and morals there uh, of, of American troops uh, compared to what Japanese Germans uh, uh, in in terms of filmmakers uh, uh, the, or films that have been made about them. Is there differences? Again, I, and I I think uh, I think Nick alluded to it. You know, when we did Banner Brothers, we, we one of the concerns was what we what would be the context? Would the audience understand the context of what? The Easy Company was was doing going through, and you know we concluded pretty quickly the only the swastika was the context. You you, you got it immediately, as Nick said. I mean it's just it's kind of the universal villain that stands in everything. I, I don't think I mean anything that we've ever Playtone's been involved with. It's never a, a, a dichotomy of our guys are good and their guys are bad, and our guys always do. We've just that's just never even a consideration because it's silly. It's it's kind of simplistic. So that that's again, I can't speak for any other anybody else, any any other projects, but that's just never been an, even a consideration for us. But I, let me, one, if I can make one last thing about the the language, the Marine, I, I know that the, the the veteran was right, and um, we part of the using a little bit bluer language than they probably used was in some ways our pr probably mis a misstep in terms of trying to add some contemporary candor. Make That's it right. feel a little bit more contemporary. Uh, it was a mistake, and I again, but I do think he made such of an issue of it to me that it was a matter. He was accurate, of course, but it was such it was so important to him because it was really his way of saying I was there. I was there. You weren't. Yes, that's right. And I was. <laughs> yes, we weren't. Okay, uh, I think. Uh... We have about 15 minutes left, uh, so we want to let the audience get into this a little bit. Uh, so, uh, Jeremy or, or Mike, uh, uh, who are uh, out there and, and uh, ready to forward some questions from the audience, uh, fire away. Well, thank you very much, panelists. Uh, we've got uh, some good questions in the in the queue, and uh, you know I'll read them to the panel. Here's the first question: uh, James Edwards appeared in several of these films. Uh, are we aware of any backlash he received for his participation? You know, certainly, uh, you know, Robert uh, and, and perhaps Nick, uh, you could you could uh, kind of address this one. There's, if you want a really complete answer to that question, there's actually a, a little scene, but excellent biography of James Edwards. I forget what it's called now, but you can look it up uh, on Amazon. Um, I don't know about backlash. I know that some theater owners in the South wrote letters complaining that it was very difficult for them to keep their audiences, you know, in order while such films were playing. I know that James Edwards was, in distinction, treated as a hero um, and received the, the key to Harlem on Home of the Brave Day in New York City in 1949. So there was certainly some admiration. This came from the NAACP and other civil rights organizations. I don't know about any backlash, uh, but he was the choice for um, the uh, black soldier, black veteran in, in the late 40s, early 50s, Home of the Brave, Bright Victory, Fraulein, um, Steel Helmet, the, the list goes on. Um, but yeah, get the biography, it's excellent. 
Yeah, thanks for that. That's great. And, okay. and uh, I'll, I'll tee up the next one. The uh, you know the question here, and, and this uh, Nick, I think will go to you. You know, you'd mentioned this. What about the movie Patton? You know, it, it's the point here is arguably the most influential. And uh, if you could offer your comments on that, that'd be great. Well, I think that's a very interesting movie, um, and I've I've taught it in class. But what um, uh, really strikes me is the way the movie tries to have it both ways, that it tries to be somehow countercultural, critical of the military, but also endorsing of the World War II effort and preserving and respectful of uh, some elements of uh, the good war, uh, particularly around the representation of General Bradley. Uh, so um, I, I see it as a really good example of a very common thing in Hollywood, which is maximizing your audience, even with a controversial film, and trying to be seen to appeal to the most, or to the most people. But I think it's a great film, and it's amazing how uh, many references you have to Patton in popular culture, especially that opening scene with the where he's standing in front of the giant flag. I mean, there's at least three times in The Simpsons when they uh, uh, uh -huh. allude to that. That's really part of our popular culture. So, yeah, an amazingly influential film. Yeah, and, and, and of course, uh, regular army uh, language too, right? The... Uh, <laughs> the uh, it, anybody else that Rob? Anybody else want to comment on, on, on that? I think it's okay. interesting with Pat. That was good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go on. I was just going to say it's interesting. Nick mentioned the treatment of the Allies, and, and Patton's one of those films that um, I think occasionally British audiences find a little bit needling because there's this sort of. <laughs> Monty's a bit of a joke, <laughs> is he not? <laughs> yeah. Is that right, Nick? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Though uh, Monty lost me when he went to South Africa and told them they had a wonderful system of government. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Fair great. enough. Okay, Mike, what's next? All right, Nick, um, a question uh, from Dan out there. What about the German directors in Hollywood, uh, such as uh, Fritz Lang? And... Uh, Nick, I, I think you, you probably could feel this one, but you know certainly our, our other comrades as well. No, I'm sure that that's, uh, um, well, th th they're uh, very prominent and visible in making wartime movies, including some of the movies, sorry, that, that came before uh, America um, joined World War II. Uh, and um, they're absolutely part of the story. And um, I, I'm, I, I'm sure that that would be part of a, uh, a different kind of representation of, of um, Germany. I would, one, one thing about Fritz Lang, my, one of my favorite of his films is called Manhunt. And yes, it so was, I was just thinking. Walter, yeah. Walter Pidgeon plays a, a, a Brit who is um, a big game hunter, and he's par he parachutes into Germany with the idea of tracking and killing Adolf Hitler. This is and this was before the war. I believe. It's set before. Yeah, it's um, from a novel, uh, Rogue Mail. Uh, the strange thing, and this is where movies and reality diverge, the British intelligence actually knew by 1944 where Hitler was going to be, how they could infiltrate a sniper to shoot him, but they decided they wouldn't because anybody else would have done a better job of running Germany, and they figured they'd have the best chance of winning the war if Hitler stayed in charge through 1944 <laughs> to 45. So, I mean, you know, that, that one, I thought maybe that's a Playtone movie right there, Operation uh, Foxtrot, uh, they, they, the decision not to murder Hitler. Uh, uh, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. It's interesting, too, um, a lot of these, you know, European exiles were, of course, exiled from fascism. And right. after the war, it was men like uh, Kurt Siodmak, who's perhaps most famous for writing The Wolfman, but he also wrote some, uh, you know, rather less fantastical films. Um, and it was them, some of them, who were still trying to talk about the threat of a resurgent fascism, even as the American film industry turned rather more directly towards the threat of Soviet communism, right? Um, so there's a film called Berlin Express from 1948, which is a Warner Brothers film that C.O. Mack wrote. And it's like the last hurrah of Hollywood anti-fascism before the Cold War takes over and, and, and the Germans basically become 
you know, a stand-in for, for some possible future Russian invasion. You know, so, so next question, uh, you know, uh, why is it you think that the North Africa theater has been underutilized or represented as a setting for World, World War II, uh, II films? It says recently, but uh, I would say in general. So maybe open that up to the panel. Well, that's interesting because it was quite regularly used in the 1950s. Um, and um, I, I would say that the most underrepresented theater is probably the naval theater. So, uh, and I'm more indignant about that. So, I was very glad when um, uh, uh, Greyhound came out la last year, uh, because at last this part of the war was being uh, remembered once again. Um, uh, that, but that's a good that, that's a good question. I wonder if there are if there are um, the last thing I remember really going into World, World War II in North Africa would be the English Patient. And uh, that movie famously bombed at the box office. So even if it got Oscars, uh, and it was turned into a joke uh, on Frasier. Um, you know, you um, uh, once once something is not done well, uh, few producers are queuing up to uh, go back to that uh, go back to that subject matter. I kind of like that movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry I loved it. I loved it. The, the Frasier joke was you had to either be very English or very patient to enjoy the movie. <laughs> but I thought that was, it was really unfair. Uh, it's a, a great movie with really interesting um, uh, issues in it. Well, okay, Mike. Th th that's great. Um, you know, here's a question. You know, how did their service in World War II affect the filmmakers themselves? You know, George Stevens was profoundly affected, you know, never making another comedy. Uh, if if uh, I'm sure each of you could could comment on that. And Nick, I see your head nodding. So maybe we'll start with you and, and go around. Well, I know that um, uh, George Stevens' son, who I interviewed about this, told me that um, uh, the, the death of uh, Tory in Shane was absolutely set up so that you'd see somebody die blown backwards into mud to uh, take any glamour out of violence that had been in previous motion pictures. So he, uh, Stevens was really trying to bring the reality of violence uh, home to um, uh, an audience quite explicitly. Yeah, apparently, because uh, I interviewed George Stevens Jr. once myself for a series we did, and he said he told us that his father, for that scene, had had the uh, prop master shoot the gun, the prop gun, into a barrel to enhance the sound. Um, I, if any, for to, the best answer to that question, I think, is to read the book Five Came Back by Mark Harris, where he yeah. talks about William Wyler and and uh, Frank Capra, John Huston, John Ford. And George Stevens, and then there was a document, a very good documentary, uh, made about on that film, which and you have Steven Spielberg, Francis Coppola, and a number of other directors talking about their predecessors and how they covered the war and how it definitely affected their personal lives and their professional lives afterwards. Yeah, I, I think, think we, right. in the case of Stevens too, I would say that uh, you know from that book and what what I've read that uh, he was he was very worried as he began to. Appreciate and, and and see the the magnitude of the uh, and a catastrophe that was happening on a on a uh, in Europe at a global scale and, and he had a, a tremendously deep uh, appreciation for it and he he thought he was all up until he went into Normandy he thought he was going to really miss it he was never going to be in and he always seemed to be out of the action and I think he was just. Uh, he was really desperate to get closer to the front lines and uh, and uh, and uh, understand and later be able to to represent what what uh, to the world uh, uh, how how violent it was and how tragic it was for for the world and, and as you said, uh, Kirk, it, it shows up in his other movies. So yeah, St Stanley Kramer, Stanley Kramer, who produced Home of the Brave, which is a film I mentioned earlier. He'd served in the Signal Corps and. He experienced as a Jewish American, you know, certain degrees of anti-Semitism while serving in the military. And I know that that was part of the reason why he chose to make Home of the Brave, a film about prejudice based on a play about anti-Semitism, which he turned into a play about anti-black, a film about anti-black prejudice, because he thought that would be more effective on screen. But yeah, his experience was with racism in the armed forces, which inspired him to make films about the war, post-war. Well, yeah. 
Well, one final example uh, if, for actors who, who had war experience, Christopher Lee, uh, the British actor, um, uh, had, had a, a, a quite an active time in World War II. And it, when he's filming the, his final scene in Lord of the Rings, um, he talks back to the director, Peter Jackson, and says, well, actually, I know what it sounds like when someone's killed with a knife. I want it to happen this way. And um, it rather uh, freaked Peter Jackson out to realize that there was a sort of this direct memory of actual violence going into this movie depicting fantasy violence. Wow. So that's why he doesn't scream. That's right. Well, um you know, Nick, we're, we're, we're toward the end of the, the time here. Uh, do, do you want to over to you to see if the folks have any uh, final remarks uh, before we close off this session? Yeah, sure. Does anybody have a, a final comment they'd like to make at this point? I think it's been a, uh, just as invigorating a discussion as we expected, and all the presentations have been terrific. Can I just say, I'll try to do this very briefly, Nick. When um, we had a screening of Vanderbilt, at, in Normandy many years ago. And we brought, an HBO, I should say, brought a number of the filmmakers and, and the vet, and veterans of Easy Company to a theater, a temporary theater they had built right off of Utah Beach. And when we were in the buses taking us from the train station to the theater, uh, we would drive down these, this country lane, and every once in a while there'd be a stone cottage that looked like it was built around circa 900 AD with an elderly couple out front. And they um, would be waving at the buses. And you realize that that couple, in some way, probably lived there in 1944 or 1945. So when they were waving, they weren't waving at Tom Hanks or Steven Spielberg or Hollywood. They were waving at the, the men who liberated them. And so even though that liberation could have, was dirty and deadly and unglamorous and, um, and it was a, and could be a soul-crushing business, but when you see those waves, it you kind of understand you kind of understand the mythology. Was it those guys were not mythological to those people? So I, there's a the, the, you understand the mythologizing of the business when you see that. Anything you want to tell us about your upcoming uh, series? It's uh, <laughs> well, <Matt, laughs> what is coming. Well, what is coming you, out? <laughs> uh, hopefully, the end of this. Ho right, hopefully yeah. at the end of this year on Apple Plus as a 10-part right. series. We're all going to look forward to that. I think it's going to yeah. be just wonderful. Well, listen, let me uh, thank you all for a wonderful uh, kickoff to this conference. Uh, I think uh, and, and uh, our MC uh, Mike, delivering all the questions, and uh, Jeremy Collins uh, in the background uh, curating the, the questions for us. It's been, it's been just great.